Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. Jesus went home with his disciples, and such a crowd collected that they could not even have a meal. When his relatives heard of this, they set out to take charge of him, and convinced, convinced that he was out of his mind. The scribes who had come down from Jerusalem were saying, Belzebul is in him, and it is through the prince of devils that he casts devil out, devils out. So he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot last. And if a household is divided against itself, that household can never stand. Now if Satan has rebelled against himself and is divided, he cannot stand either. It is the end of him. But no one can make his way into a strong man's house and burgle his property unless he has tied up the strong man first. Only then can he burgle his house. I tell you solemnly, all men's sins will be forgiven and all their blasphemies. But let anyone blaspheme against the Holy Spirit and he will never have forgiveness. He is guilty of an eternal sin. This was because they were saying, an unclean spirit is in him. His mother and brothers now arrived and standing outside sent in a message asking for him. A crowd was sitting round him by the time the message was passed to him. Your mother and brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. He replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking round at those sitting in a circle about him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Anyone who does the will of God, that person is my brother and sister and mother. So here we have quite a long gospel for the 10th Sunday of Ordinary Time. And it is divided into three chunks. We can see three different little bits to it. Um, and it happens in chapter 3 of St. Mark. So we're still... At the beginning of the of the public ministry of Jesus, although St. Mark goes really fast, so a lot has happened in the first two chapters and even at the beginning of the third chapter. But we're back in St. Mark in Capernaum where St. Mark identifies the home of Jesus. We're at home. This is where, where how the gospel begins. Jesus went home with his disciples. He's just been around. In fact, he's just been calling them up the mountain. He has chose the, chosen the twelve. And that's uh, the, the, the scripture we have just before uh, that particular piece that we have this Sunday. And here it is. Uh, Mark 3, verses 13 to 19. He went up into the hills and call to him those whom he desired. So that's the call of the of the apostles who are all named. And that's the, the passage that precedes immediately, uh, precedes immediately uh, our, our gospel tonight. So after going up into the hill to call the, the 12 apostles, he, he now comes, uh, comes home. He, he went home with his disciple. And such a crowd collected that they could not even have a meal. So that's where he is, in Capernaum, home. And we have these three different chunks, even though it looks like the beginning and the end go together and the middle is, is, is a bit of, a, of a, um, an event that stuck within without any connection to the beginning or the end. At the beginning we have uh, the relatives who come to, see, uh, to take charge of Jesus, to seize Jesus, because they are convinced he was out of his mind. That's how it begins. Then we have the scribes who arrive saying he's got Belzebul in him. It's Satan acting in him. And then at the end, we are back with uh, the motif of the relatives, the family, his mother and brothers now arrived. So we have the first lot of relatives, now his mother and brothers. 
which is bizarre because we start being home. Jesus went home. So that means his relatives, his mother and brothers, lives, live not in the home where Jesus is. In other words, Jesus has made his home somewhere else. Uh, he's not living now where he came from. He's not living in Nazareth. He has moved home, which is very peculiar, very unusual. He has made his home somewhere else, and so that the people who live in his home, the people from his town, his relatives and his close family, his mother and brothers, who are not his blood brothers, but his uh, his extended family, they all arrive and are looking for him. So we have those two opening and closing, and in between we have the scribes accusing him of uh, having Belzebul in him. Belzebul is the name of... Uh, a prince of the prince of demon, it says, the prince of devils. Uh, Belzebul is an ancient name uh, of a Baal, an idol uh, that was worshipped in Ekron, and it's it's been applied now to Satan by the scribes uh, who have come from Jerusalem. And of course, this accusation is very serious. The accusation by the scribes who accused Jesus of having Belzebul in him. Is, is an accusation that could lead him uh, to die. It's a very serious matter. It's a legal ac accusation. Because in the Jewish law, in the law of Moses, uh, we have in Leviticus 20, 27, a man or a woman who is a medium or a wizard, so who has an evil spirit, who allows him to, to perform miracles, to perform things that are not natural, shall be put to death. They shall be stoned with stones, their blood shall be upon them. And in a way, that's exactly what the scribes are accusing Jesus uh, of doing. He does all that he does through the power of the evil one. Um, so it is a legal accusation, and they are seeking already to put him to death, which goes ties in with what has happened just at the beginning of uh, chapter 3 in St. Mark, where we had one of the most dramatic miracles of Jesus, not dramatic in the sense that it was rising someone from the dead, but dramatic in the sense that it, it, the consequence of that miracle was the, dis the decision to destroy Jesus. So it's Mark 1, 1 to 6, um, where Jesus, Mark 3, 1 to 6, where Jesus enters the synagogue and meets with the ha man with the withered hand, and they watched him to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. So they're already plotting, we're only in chapter 3 in Mark, and they're already plotting the destruction of Jesus. And here, of course, here with the, the gospel that we have tonight is, the, is another instance of confrontation with the scribes who now have come all the way from Jerusalem to accuse him. The scribes who had come down from Jerusalem were saying, Belzebul is in him, and it is through the prince of the devil that he cast devils out. Uh, and it was a, a belief, apparently, um, sort of a common belief that uh, the, the, uh, the, most the more powerful demons would, would destroy the lesser ones, which doesn't really make sense, as Jesus explains, how can Satan be divided against himself? How can Satan cast Satan out? Here, here we have this very strong accusation in the middle of this confrontation with his relatives. And so we, we have all sorts of ways in which Jesus reveals his identity and his mission through these confrontations. We understand a lot more about Jesus in that gospel through all these confrontations that keep coming to him. And he really now addresses what is thought of him and reverses everything. He reverses the notion of his relatives, he reverses the notion of his family, he reverses the notions of the scribes. So we have this division and unity, division with, with those who come against him and try to shape him into what he is not, unity with his disciples. 
and we have a whole interaction of the inside and the outside. The whole scene takes place in his home in Capernaum, which supposedly is the house of Peter then. Um, so in his home in Capernaum, and we have those who come from outside, the relatives, the scribes, his close family, and those who are already inside, sitting at his feet, listening to him. Uh, but we have also the inside and outside in another way, because we have those who come so from outside to to try to figure out what's inside of him. Is it Belzebul? Is it the prince of devils? Or is it the Holy Spirit? What is inside of Jesus? And in so doing, Jesus then takes this opportunity to reveal to them what's inside of them. So it's, it's both inside the house and inside Jesus, inside the human person as well. We have this being in or being out. And being in, of course, means being a disciple of Jesus, being one who does the will of the Father. Those three events uh, are a very clear and brilliant example of one of the points that C.S. Lewis made in God in the Docks about and it's in a, a point of apologetics, saying, well, Jesus can't just be a nice man. He, he can't just be a lovely, gentle man. He has to be either mad, or bad, or God. And in fact, this argument was taken up again by Canon John Redford, uh, who, who was a, a, a wonderful figure at Maryville for a long, a long time. And he wrote a, a book called uh, Ban, Mad, Bad, or God. And, and this, is, this is where we, we find it in that gospel. The first, the first couple of verses, Jesus went home and such a crowd collected that they could not even have a meal. When his relatives heard of this, they set out to take charge of him. The word is, taking charge of him is seizing. They want to seize him. They want to take hold of him by force. So that uh, we have exactly the same words in other places in scripture. In Mark 12:12, 12, 12, they tried to arrest him, but feared the multitude, for they perceived that he had told a parable against them. So that's the Pharisees, the scribes, the Pharisees trying to arrest Jesus. That's the same word, seize him. And then in Mark 14:45, 46, we have the betrayal of Judas and the arrest of Jesus. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Master, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. That's the same word. So they literally want to arrest him. They want to grab him. It is violent. Why do they want to do this? Because they think he's mad. Uh, convinced that he was out of his mind. They think he's completely mad. He's lost it. He doesn't even eat. He has got all his priorities wrong. He... There, there's something really, really wrong about him. It's not the Jesus they have known for 30 years who hadn't begun his public ministry, who, who wasn't just normally living among them. So that's what the relatives think, uh, convinced that he was out of his mind. And that's either Jesus is mad. That was the first point. He, he, you know, he might be insane. And so that would explain his very, very odd behavior. Or he is bad, and that's the point of the scribes. Belzebul is in him. He's trying to deceive everyone. He's trying to manipulate. He's trying to um, divide. He's trying to destroy. He might be bad. This is the point of the scribes. And the other, the but the other only other explanation to this is that he is God, and that that is actually what he claims about himself here again. I tell you solemnly, all men's sins will be forgiven and all their blasphemies, but let anyone blaspheme against the Holy Spirit and he will never have forgiveness. He is guilty of an eternal sin. This was because they were saying an unclean spirit is in him. In other words, it is when Jesus acts and talks and, and performs miracles, drives out evil spirits, he is um, acting under the power of the Holy Spirit. He is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh, not by adoption like us, but by this union, he is God. God with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And so what the scribes accusing him of being evil are doing is actually blasphemy. 
so we have this m mad, bad or god motif and these are the really the only logical reasonings we can have about Jesus if we look at his life, if we look at what he says, if we look at what he does. Mad, bad or god. We have also this notion that Jesus makes his home where he chooses. So we, we're in the home of uh, Peter, in fact, and it is uh, we have it in Mark already, um, but we have it also in Matthew 17, 25. And when he came home, Jesus spoke to him. When they came to Capernaum and when he came home, in the, the two verses make very clear that Capernaum is his home and that it's, in fact, um, a, uh, Peter's house. And in Mark 2, 1, when he returned to Capernaum after Sundays, it was reported that he was home. So it is the, the house of Peter. What is uh, beautiful as well is that Jesus is so taken up in our gospel with teaching, with healing, with ministering to the people that he doesn't even have time to eat. So uh, there was such a crowd collected that he could not even have a meal. The, the word is he could not even have bread. And immediately the, the, the word bread reminds us uh, of, of uh, the temptation in the desert, which wasn't actually spelt out in, in Mark, but which Matthew spelled out and Luke as well. And the first temptation of course, that uh, this temptation to transform the the, lo uh, the stones into loaves of bread, and Jesus answers the devil: "Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God." And here, in his home, in his house, with his disciples around him, Jesus lives that priority of the word of God by giving, pouring out the word of God to them, he who is the word of God, and he's also feeding them, he's the bread from heaven, the bread we have celebrated last Sunday in Corpus Christi. So he may not have bread, physical bread to he eat himself, but he feeds those who are in his home with himself, with the words spoken uh, in his teaching, with his miracles. Um, his ministry to them, his love for them, his charity. But we have that home of Jesus. And, and, and so it, it is a contrast with the priority of a physical, which is always uh, foremost in our, in our consciousness, which we should never dismiss. But also the priority here is... is upside down with Jesus, now it becomes the priority of God, the priority of the Word of God that truly feeds the human person, that the human person is primarily made for, even though that physical bread should never be left out completely. We have this confrontation between the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit and Belzebul, which I've spoken about. We have this confrontation between the power of Jesus and the strong man or the strong one which is Satan. And it is a very, very odd parable. And it comes into the three synoptic gospel, the strong man, the, the, the man who, who breaks into the strong man's house. And Jesus compares himself to the burglar, which is really strange because burglary is not good, it's a sin. And yet Jesus compares himself to the burglar who... Um, ties, binds the strong man and 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 then burgle, burgle, burgles his house. So why is Jesus comparing himself to a burglar? What is this story about? Um, and here we have, if you want, a, a bit of a cosmic parable about the mission of Jesus, the identity of Jesus, what is actually happening in front of our eyes in the Gospel. That since the fall, the world has fallen into the power of Satan. Satan is the strong man who has bound creation to himself through the power of sin, who has particularly bound the human person to himself through the power of sin, so that the human person is now enslaved to his power. And Jesus comes to bind the strong man, Satan, and to take over his house, which was not his to start off with, 
but which he, had, he has claimed for himself. And so he, in a few words, in that tiny parable which comes into all Gospels, all three synoptic Gospels, in those few words we have the whole fight of good and evil. We have the whole uh, cosmic uh, battle and, and this is achieved by this man in Galilee, in this house, filled with people, with the scribes coming to accuse him. In front of us, in front of our eyes, in the text of the Gospel, in the life of the Church, is happening this binding of the strong man, and Jesus takes over. Jesus takes possession of his creation. Jesus takes possession of the human person, who had been bound by the strong man and, and makes his home, precisely. So now we see really the significance of Jesus being, being in his home, surrounded by his disciple. What he's talking about, this binding of the strong man and burgling his house, is actually happening as he speaks. Because here, what we have is this new reality of the disciples of Jesus. Now the natural family of Jesus is extended. His mother and brothers who have arrived and want to be with him, he already has them all around him. So not only are they his mothers and brothers by, by the bonds of flesh, but now by the bonds of the spirit, by the bonds of faith, by the bond of obedience to the Father's will, that family has grown and will grow. And that house, that home, will extend to the bounds of the, of the earth throughout all ages, and it's the house of the church. And the burglar has come in and has taken over the property of the strong man. So we, we see how this, these three odd bits in the Gospel uh, of Sunday actually tie themselves together very beautifully and actually reveal to us something very profound about the mission of Jesus and his identity. In those three gospel, uh, those three passages tied up together in that gospel uh, on Sunday, we have the revelation of the Trinity, first of all. We have this unmistakable proclamation of the Trinity. Of course, we have two events, the baptism of Jesus and the transfiguration, where, where the, the proclamation of the Trinity is very, very real and where, where we, it's the most explicit, if you want. The Father's voice, the Spirit in the dove, Jesus in the flesh, the Son of God. But here we have uh, the Holy Spirit is mentioned and is mentioned as, uh, is revealed as living in Jesus. He's revealed as being one with Jesus. Because when Jesus accuses them uh, the scribes of blasphemy, he's accusing them of, of something he has, they have said against him, Jesus, and yet he's saying, you have said it against the Holy Spirit. So Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And of course, the one who's not explicitly mentioned is the Father, and yet the Father is uh, implicitly there all the time. But particularly at the end, his mother and brother's now arrived, and then, who are my mother and my brothers? Here are my bro mother and my brothers. Anyone who does the will of God, that person is my brother and sister and mother, but not father. The father is never mentioned. Why? Because the will of God is, of course, the will of the father. There is a new household of which the father is the head. And anyone can belong to this household because Jesus has extended his sonship to anyone, to everyone. Anyone who does the will of God um, is united to Jesus. And united to Jesus shares the same Father of Jesus by adoption. Shares the same Spirit of Jesus by adoption. And so the Father is here, anyone who does the will of God. The whole household, as it should be, is, is under the, the headship of the Father. And Jesus has come into the world to um, take over the house of Satan, take over the house of slavery and make it the house of the Father where everyone, um, everyone is part of the family, not a slave anymore.
mother and, bro and brothers and sisters of Jesus. And of course his mother is here prominently as one who has always done the will of the Father. So we have the, the revelation of the Blessed Trinity. We, we see how God defeats Satan by being stronger than Satan. And how does God defeat Satan? Well, Jesus defeats Satan all the time, particularly in the Gospel of Mark. It's, it's very vivid. Uh, all the references to exorcism are rife. And, and in fact, Mark is the uh, only Gospel which starts with the first miracle that is an exorcism. So we have that in Mark 1, 21 to 28. The first miracle of Jesus in, in the Gospel of St. Mark as soon as it begins, within 20 verses, is an exorcism. And every time Jesus overcomes evil, every time, every time there is a confrontation with evil, Jesus overcomes evil. And Mark continues to describe his ministry, and every time he mentions not only physical evil, the evil of diseases, not only does he mention all these healings that are happening, so the a reordering of a world that has fallen prey to disorder and sin and suffering, but he mentions explicit uh, encounters and, and fights against evil uh, by exorcism. So we have it in Mark 3, 11, whenever the unclean spirits beheld him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. This is God coming into the world, overcoming the powers of darkness, overcoming the prince of the world, the strong man. So God has overcome evil, but of course, how does he overcome evil in the end? By his own obedience. Anyone who does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. That doesn't leave him out. It's by being obedient, by his obedience, he overcomes evil. Is loving obedience. It's an obedience that is free and that is loving. So it is through love uh, that hate is overcome. And of course we have his example. We have the sign of the cross, the crucifix, which reminds us of how it is that God has conquered evil. How it is that the power of darkness is defeated. And, and the, the hope of the resurrection. The life eternal where no evil will be experienced. No suffering ever uh, enter. So he defeats Satan, he builds his kingdom in the world, he makes his home with us. God in Jesus makes his home in us, with us. It is extraordinary to think that God the Son would have a home in Capernaum that he has chosen for himself. He just took, took over the house of his best friend. And from there he recruits his family those who sit around him and do the will of the Father. All of, this, all of these aspects that I've been talking about are actually summarized in the Our Father. In the Our Father, we have an amazing summary of everything that Jesus does and everything the Holy Spirit does in us as well. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, the holiness of God, God, God being worshipped. The prince of this world is, is destroyed. The prince of this world is not a prince. He's, he has no kingship. He has no lordship. The father whose name is worshipped. He's the one. Thy kingdom come. Of course the kingdom of God comes when evil is overcome. And we see that in our gospel. But we see that through the cross and the resurrection. That is what Jesus has done. He has brought in the kingdom of God into humanity, into human history. Thy will be done, that is what he has done, and that is what the Holy Spirit does in us, enabling us to do the will of the Father um, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. He is our bread. So he's come, he can't even eat bread in his own home, and yet he's the one who himself is the bread of every human heart that longs and thirsts for a kind of love that cannot be found uh, just this side of earth among from creatures alone. Forgive us our debt as we also have forgiven our debtors. Of course, he's the one who forgives everything and takes on all our debts. So he's the forgiveness of God for us. And lead us not into temptation. He has faced temptations for us 
but deliver us from evil. And that is what he does. Jesus delivers us from evil. He is the only one who has this power because he is the only one who is more powerful than the strong man and who can get into that house and take over. So all of this is summed up in the Our Father. What does it mean for us? Well, in a way, we can see the whole world, the whole of creation as the house of the strong one who has deceitfully taken over what was not his uh, through the fall and, and the, the enslavement of sin. We can also see the human person as the property of the strong one, of Satan, under the reign of sin. And that is precisely what Jesus comes in to do. He comes in not just outside, he comes inside of each one of us. And he has the power to unbind. And that is precisely the power of forgiveness. That is the power we find in the sacrament of reconciliation. He has the power to unbind us. He has the power to rescue us from the enemy within, as it were. He has the power to rescue us from, from the, the slavery of sin. From that being the house of the strong one, the one where sin dwells, we become, like Jesus, through his power, through his redemption, his cross and resurrection, we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. So that the blaspheme that uh, Jesus accuses the scribes of, uh, when they, they accuse him of, of being um, acting under the power of Satan, can be turned against us as well. We are temples of the Holy Spirit at baptism, and the Holy Spirit uh, continues to make his home in us so long as we don't fall again, under, bind ourselves again under the power of the strong one. But the Holy Spirit, of course, is more powerful. But we are temples of the Holy Spirit. We are brothers, sister, mother to Jesus when we do the Father's will. So we belong to that new supernatural family. A family not so much with fleshly bond, with natural bonds, but with supernatural bonds of faith, hope and charity. And this is real. It's an absolute reality. If we let God enter in the house of our being, in the house of our interior life, in the house of our spirit, of our soul, he takes over and makes us his in the most profound way, in a way that we find hard to believe um, sometimes and which we must absolutely put our faith in. This is the reality of who we are. Temples of the Holy Spirit, adopted children of God, brothers and sister and mother to Jesus. He has made us his, he has bound the strong man. Uh, so all these disciples sat around him, this is us. And of course, the whole of us together, that's the church. The church extends through times and space to all those who have sat around Jesus as we sit in the pews in the church and done his will. Not just sat and listened to him, but actually done the Father's will. Which in our scripture seems to be resumed in listening to Jesus. Because that's all they are doing. Um, when Jesus tells uh, the, the you know looking around at those sitting in a circle about him he said here are my mother and brothers anyone who does the will of God so in other words being sat in circle around Jesus they are doing the will of God which is a very passive uh, understanding of being a disciple but it's the beginning is without sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to him there is no discipleship uh, running around won't do it. And and the sort of charity that Jesus has at the beginning that we see that he, he gives himself, pours himself so totally to those in the house that he doesn't even ha have time to eat, uh, that charity will be only passed on to us if, we're, if we give him enough time, if we uh, listen to him, if we spend time with him so that he can really truly invade the house of our heart uh, and that's when that charity takes over then we will find ourselves doing all sorts of things but it begins by sitting at his feet and listening to him and of course that's an attitude we see most primarily in Our Lady um, she listens 
She has listened at the Annunciation. She sat and waited, and when the Holy Spirit came, when, when the angel came and announced the coming of Jesus, that he would take flesh in her womb, she said yes, she was totally available. And those people sitting in circle around Jesus are available to him, so that he can take over the house of their hearts, which is freely offered, not through slavery, not through compulsion, but in loving freedom. So that's the church is the house of Peter where everyone can gather. So that crowd um, which gathers into the house is, a, is a, an image of the whole church gathering into the house of Peter. Of course, the Pope is the successor of Peter, the visible sign of unity of the church. And that's where we all gather around him. And Jesus has made his home in Peter's house. That's the home of Jesus. That, that's where we can be assured to find him. He has bound himself to the church. He has decided to make his home not for any merit of anyone in the church, but by his free, loving decision. It's his choice that makes us holy. And so um, Jesus has, has basically invaded the place. He has taken over, as he would have taken over the house of the strong man. He has taken over the house of Peter forever. Because there is no end to the reality of the church. It's not just a human institution, it's a divine institution. It's the, the, the house, the home of Jesus, and so the home of God forever. Uh, it will not end. It's conquered from the strong one, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the family of Jesus. Uh, those who are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, who have God as their Father, who have Jesus as their brother who have the Holy Spirit as their host within them, and it is an eternal reality.